if I'm going to be spending eight hours a day for 50 years going into work, do I want that time to have meant something at the end of it? Hello and welcome back to 40 Minute Mentor, your weekly dose of pocket-sized career mentorship. In this final replay episode, we are resharing our Sifted Summit panel discussion on purpose over profit. This episode is really timely as the UK's biggest movers and shakers in the tech scene will be meeting up again at this year's Sifted Summit in London. To discuss how purpose and profit can coexist in business, you're going to be hearing from three amazing guests. Emma Steele, partner at Ascension, an early stage VC built by entrepreneurs to back the next generation of tech and impact founders. Amali Del Alwis, former CEO of Subac, the world's first non-for-profit accelerator that scales climate impact through data, policy and behavior change. And Nikki Wicks, CEO of The Body Coach, the popular fitness brand behind Joe Wicks, who are on a mission to get people moving and live healthier lives. This is a topic more relevant than ever today, and I can't wait for you to hear it. And don't forget, you can watch the full recording from the Sifted Summit stage back over on our YouTube channel. Simply search for 40 Minute Mentor, Purpose versus Profit. So sit back, relax, and I really hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the 40 Minute Mentor. Thank you all so much for joining us. It's a A genuine privilege to be here and an even bigger honour to have such legends around me who I'll be introducing or they'll be introducing themselves shortly. Um, For those of you that don't know me, I'm James Mitra. I'm the founder of JBM. We're a search firm that places executives and future leaders into high growth businesses uh, and particularly those with a strong purpose, which is part of the conversation we're having today. I think what we've seen in the last few years is a seismic shift in candidate motivation. I think gone are the days where all the talent want to go work in big banks or big consultancies, no offense if anyone's from that environment, but there's the main number one rep- repetitive thing we keep hearing from talent is I want to work for a purpose-driven company. I want to work with inspiring founders and CEOs that are doing good in the world and I want to have an impact. So we've been like thrilled to see this kind of just kind of uh, repeating on itself and um, I think this last couple of days have really like reinforced that from so many of the conversations that I've been in so we thought it was a perfect time to bring together three very purpose-driven leaders um, to talk about um, this topic about purpose over profit or purpose and profit um, so to kick us off please can you all introduce yourselves uh, and share a bit about how you define uh, purpose in your businesses. So we'll start with Amali. Over to you. Thank you very much, James. And so lovely to be here. Really, really great to be able to kind of share. Um, so my name is Amali. I'm the chief exec of a company called Subac. Um, so we're an organization which is climate focused. And the way that we're kind of solving climate challenges is through data. And um, so we run an early stage accelerator actually for not-for-profits. Uh, we fund research fellows, anyone doing really interesting stuff around uh, data and, and climate um, we also have a global data catalogue, which is mapping uh, available data anywhere in the world. Uh, so all of you can go to data.sobac.org and find that if you are interested in a bit of a data junkie like myself. Um, going on to, I guess, thinking about that purpose and profit part, uh, from a Subac standpoint, I mean, ultimately, it's are we helping to stop the dial? Are we helping to change things as far as that ever-increasing speed towards, you know, beyond 1.5 degrees up to 2 degrees? And frankly... You know, I think if we don't have a livable planet in 100 years, that's pretty much the biggest problem that any of us uh, can be solving. Um, but looking to that, and I guess our role within that, not only sort of helping the organizations we work with to get through to that goal, but also what are the interventions we make to enable them to think about greater impact, think about how they scale their impact, think about how they work more effectively, connect, collaborate, um, and hopefully sort of have better outcomes as a result of it. Amazing. Yeah. And I can't think of a more important purpose than that. And um, Nikki, over to you. Hello. Thank you, James. Um, hello, everyone. Um, firstly, I'm a bit nervous. So if I start to ramble, I will, I will try my best to get back on track. But um, my name's Nikki. I am the CEO at The Body Coach. Um, I run the business with my brother, Joe Wicks, who is, who is The Body Coach. Um, I, was, I was living a very happy and content life in Singapore about seven years ago. Um, I was a magazine, I was editing campaign magazine. 
and um, Joe called me and said, oh, um, this thing I've started is starting to get, you know, a bit of uh, traction and like, come and help me. And um, he said, I want to, you know, I really think we can sort of get more people moving and, and exercising. And um, that was that was seven years ago, uh, almost, yeah, seven years ago now. And um, when I think about it, like, really the question that me and Joe still ask ourselves every day, um, and I speak to about 10 times a day, we're very close. Um, he's, he's 18 years, 18 months younger than me, sorry. So we're very, very close in age. Um, and yeah, we're still trying to answer that same question now, which is how can we get more people moving? Um, how can we help more people? Um, and yeah, so that's, I guess our purpose is, um, it's, it was never, we never started with a purpose. Let's go and try and do this thing. It was, Joe was a personal trainer and it, it just be kind of became, okay, I'm helping two people. Now I'm helping five people. And, and it was like, how can I help more people? Um, and we're still kind of trying to answer that question now. Really. Amazing. Such an organic story. And I can't wait to dig into it a bit more. I think everyone here will probably have done a workout with Joe at some point. I did throughout lockdown. The only exercise I did was with my uh, six-year-old who shamed me into how unfit I was. Um, but it's been, uh, yeah, it's been amazing to see the, the business uh, sort of thrive. Um, Emma, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, James. And actually, it's funny, you, you were mentioning seven years ago, six years ago. Actually, I met you six years ago Indeed. when um, I left, I left um, my career in banking and I absolutely wanted to try and find something that was purpose driven at the time. And I, I knew, I mean, I didn't quite know what I was going to end up with. And it was a couple of years after that I, I um, started at Ascension, where I am now. So I'm, I'm a partner at a VC firm called Ascension. It's a, it's a pre-seed, um, early stage investor based in London. And although we have a, a generalist tech fund, we really focus on, on social impact. And um, for us, it's really about being quite specifically thesis driven. So it's not just any impact theme. It's, uh, the fund is all about investing in tech solutions that drive down um, social inequalities. So we, we find... Um, founders and business models, any tech-enabled solutions out there that will somehow um, affect uh, or, or solve market failures that create social inequalities. And that can be in um, the financial system, that can be in energy, insurance, consumer goods, transport. Um, and so it's, it's quite a wide, um, a wide array of, of, um, of areas. And I've been doing this for five years now. Um, and I guess, yeah, the, the the entire purpose for me is to prove that you can achieve venture returns whilst um, investing in impact uh, in a focused way. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and yeah, it's been amazing to see, you know, you, you set your goal on this uh, yeah. a number of years ago and it's been incredible to see how you, you know, were very deliberate in that. And I think that's a great example for anybody that might be listening to this that might be in a job or career that maybe they're not loving and wants to join a purpose-driven business. There's so much opportunity out there and sometimes you've just got to work hard and be quite deliberate in that. Um, Amali, I want to come to you. Um, you've led a number of impact-focused businesses, um, and including Code First Girls, um, and now Suba. So we know, and I know firsthand as a founder, uh, scaling a business comes with lots of challenges, uh, lots of pressures. Um, what would you say are some of the most difficult parts of scaling, particularly a purpose-driven company? I, I think the there are lots of really common challenges, whether you're purpose-driven, whether you're a for-profit or a not-for-profit. Um, but I think it's almost the, the impact part is the bit which you just need to rethink. You need to reframe because you can't go to the more traditional impact metrics like, you know, how has my team, how many more people have I got? Or, um, you know, how much has my revenue and my profit increased? Or how many more countries am I operating in? Um, so, it's not to say that there aren't other impact metrics. I mean, if you're looking at a commercial enterprise, you might be looking at how great is my customer experience or how have we engaged people or how have we inspired people or how has our brand spread? So I, I don't think it's actually fundamentally hugely different, um, but I do think that it requires you to think much more carefully about what that impact thesis is and to try and unpick what the levers for that are mm -hmm. and what are the things that matter to you? What are the things that will make a difference? And how are you looking at the relationship between what you put in versus that impact that you set, set out if it's not just money? Mm -hmm. Because the money in, money out relationship isn't a direct relationship. So, you know, trying to think about that more carefully, I think, is important. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there are lots of examples 
Theranos being the most famous perhaps of where there's probably been a great uh, sort of purpose in the, you know, originally, and yet sometimes you can go off track, you know, maybe in pursuit of profit. So, I mean, we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, Nikki, you described the body coach as being like an accidental business. You talked about that kind of organic story. And I'm sure there's going to be purpose driven founders listening to this that are going to maybe going through a similar thing where they stumble across an idea and then either take the plunge or maybe they, maybe they don't. But, you know, I think there's a lot out there that come from wanting to solve a problem that just exists or something they suddenly like really believe in. Um, can you share a bit more about how the business has evolved from that kind of idea or that concept um, and just learnings that you can pass on to anyone here in the audience um, about, you know, anyone else who might be in a similar boat about knowing whether to push, push an idea through and, and, and kind of some of those learnings from that experience? Yeah, um, I mean, I can, I can only, you know, share my, my experience and my, and my journey um, with Joe. And like I said, I think, you know, what, what brought me back from, from Singapore doing a very different job and, and being quite happy was, I think, really to help Joe initially. It was, and wanting to protect him from this sort of, I could see kind of this, where he was sort of uh, moving into as his profile was getting bigger and I kind of wanted to be there to sort of protect him really as, a, as, a, as an older brother. Um, I also was very, you know, connected um, to what he what he was wanted to do, which was to, you know, help inspire people to get moving um, through fitness and and food. So, um, yeah, it's been a crazy, you know, ten years. So the body coach has been going for ten years now. It was ten years this summer. Um, the the business has been, you know, accidental in the sense of we've just been kind of so focused on this. Like, how do we get more people moving? Um, and then we kind of this you know, the success of the business was just happening kind of in the background without any real focus or attention. And as, as things have grown, we've had to start building around the business. But the thing we were trying to do was kind of the, the sole focus. Um, it's interesting, like this, you know, purpose over profit, you know, Joe and I have been very focused on the, on the purpose piece. And we've uh, our first ever head of finance. Um, after 10 years, we've got a head of finance now who's actually someone that's looking at the business and the numbers. He's actually, he's, he's here today. Um, one of our, you know, we, we've hired, um, we're 40 people now. So this year we've gone from 10 to 40 people because we're building this sort of organization. And um, yeah, the purpose, you know, there's been, I think it's funny because I think we care so much about what we're trying to do that any distraction is, is quite easy to say. There is a lot of noise and we've had to say no to a lot of things. But people say, like, is it, is it hard to stay focused? And I think for us, like, it isn't because... When you when you when your values are so sort of set, anything that doesn't line up with that is is just, the answer is no. Like either fits into this like checklist, which isn't an official checklist. We don't really have a like actual checklist, but we kind of go: is this right? Is this does this help people or elevate our, you know, help us elevate our message or, or give us a platform to share to share our message? And if the answer is no, then we kind of just don't don't follow it or pursue it. Oh, that's really interesting. Can you just tell us a bit about the iterations of the business? Because it started off, Joe, I know he was doing his, his yeah. cooking show, like that, and then it's morphed into kind of, I guess, lots of different avenues. But what have been the major sort of steps in that journey? Yeah, so really like quickly, Joe was a personal trainer. He started doing boot camps, like training in the park. Um, you know, starting off, nobody would turn up. And he was there on his own at six in the morning with all his kit. And it was, you know, heartbreaking. I was living, living, living with him at the time. Um he used to come in and, you know, having cycled six miles to this park and no one would be there. And it was, and then we'd all go out as a family helping him doing flyering to get people to try and come. Um, and then, you know, people did start to come. Then he started to use Twitter and, and kind of to spread his message like, here, here's a healthy, healthy recipe. Or, and an Instagram video was a big turning point. He started posting video recipes. Um, and when Instagram first came out, you could only post 15 second videos. Um, so he would post these recipes that were 15 minute meals that in a 15 second video. And so lean in 15 was actually lean in 15 seconds. And it's the reason he's, he talks so quick. Um, he doesn't talk that quick in real life, but he only had 15 seconds to put a recipe into a video. And then he got kind of traction. People started to follow his videos. And then about 50,000 followers, he got approached by a publisher to do a book, to release a cookbook. And he was like, he rang me, he's like, should I do a cookbook? And I was like, well, you're not even a chef, like you're not even a very good cook. Um, and so anyway, he was like, went along with it, did this book. And um, that book became, is the second fastest uh, selling cookbook of all time. Even now, the, the pre-orders, 
it went to number one on Amazon um, before it even came out. And he's now done 10 books. But he also then, around that time, launched an online training plan, which was a PDF, essentially a food and nutrition plan. Um, and 600,000 people went on to, to buy that product. And um, that's now become an app. So two and a half years ago, we started developing an app. Um, and now the 40 people we have in the business are all servicing the app business, really. So they're engineers. Um, we built our app with an agency. Um, so me and Joe had no idea about technology. And actually, when, um, when we were kind of approached to build an app, we, we ended up going to visit Headspace in Santa Monica. Amazing. And um, we walked in and we were really excited. And we had just been to meet Apple in, 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 in California. And they were like, yeah, you should build an app. And we were like, okay, yeah, we should, you know, Apple tell us to build an app, we should build an app. I went to visit Headspace and we walked in and there were like 300 people. And we were like, who are all these people? And we left, well, we found out they were all people like engineers and developers. And we, we left and we walked away and we were like, we're not building an app. <laughs> like, how the hell, you know, how, how the hell would you even go about? It was so scary to yeah. us. So we actually postponed it for about 18 months. Oh, wow. um, but really we knew that we had a great product that we could be better. We were like, this PDO has helped a lot of people. It's transformed a lot of people's lives. But we knew it could be better. And we knew we could reach more people with, with technology, and with an app. So yeah. that's the journey we're on now. It's now an app. Incredible. And then obviously there's, and there's loads of stuff in between. You know, P with Joe was a big moment last yeah. year. But anyway, so I'm rambling. No, no, no. It's super interesting. And I think um, I love the fact, firstly, that you've been there from day one. You know, from flyering you know, probably putting your arm around his shoulder when he felt like, you know, no, no one cared. Uh, and then you've been there every, kind of every step of the way. And it's a, it's a unique success story um, and truly organic to the point where you've gone from just a few of you to now a team of 40. And, you know, we were talking earlier about kind of the next phase of the journey, the, the scaling phase. Um, so very exciting. I guess, Emma, from a impact investor perspective, what mistakes do you see founders and, and, and CEOs make when it comes to trying to scale a purpose-driven company? And can you share some examples, perhaps from Ascension's portfolio, where they've got it really right, right? And what is it that they've done so well? I mean, I wouldn't call it mistakes per se, but I think the one thing we see a lot is founders come and they haven't really thought about like the type of capital that they need to scale their business and actually like the scale plans that they want for the business. So, um, you know, if you take a, um, a social enterprise not maybe not for profit or for profit that that you know is very community driven doesn't necessarily want to scale globally you don't need venture capital like venture capital is expensive you give up you know a lot of equity and you have loads of expectations for really fast growth and it can actually be detrimental so i think that's that's a mistake that happens quite quite a bit and i think um you know, it's it's not a mistake but but Purpose-driven founders or non-purpose-driven founders often misthink about like the size of the market that they're going for, um, it, and and therefore you know kind of what are the what are the possibilities with with what we can do. And they come you know they come to the fund and they're like, oh you know you're an impact fund, you definitely can can invest in our business. And actually you know like any impact. In, like any fund, we think, okay, can this investment theoretically return the fund? And therefore, you know, what is, what is the size of the market that, that you need to operate in? And, and a lot of the times it's too small. Um, and I think the last thing is probably like not, well, I guess not really understanding whether they want to put impact over profit, whether they want to grow impact with profit, or whether impact is kind of like a PR thing for them. And it, you know, it's not, it's not, it's maybe a little bit part of the brand, but not really part of their identity. And that has a big difference. It, it, it has a big consequence on, on what type of capital you can attract. Um, so for us, you know, we're trying to invest in commercial solutions that are scalable, where um, you can achieve the same returns as if you're investing in a non-impact business. So actually you need a founder that knows or understands and wants to scale a, a, a big business, but also has the impact really um, in lockstep with, with the, the commercial model. Um, and the, the, it's really part of the identity of, of, of the business. Um, I mean, you were saying that, you know, you weren't quite sure about the purpose 
of the business. But actually, the one thing that you kept on saying is, you know, how do we keep people moving? That's that's like the identity of the business. And that's what made you, I guess, make the right decisions along the way. And that's, you know, what we're what we're looking for. So, I mean, quick example of our portfolio, I guess Wage Stream is, is the one that's probably the biggest. It's a salary advanced business uh, in the fintech space where you can draw on your salary anytime uh, in the month and it doesn't it doesn't it helps you kind of not go to the payday loan market or, or kind of loan sharks um, before before payday um, and they can scale pretty much to anyone with salaried employees and they've done they've done really really well um, gaining market share globally but they're a massively mission driven business at the same time um, the other one is a consumer brand. Uh, you may have heard of it. It's called Urban Legend. There are, it, it's the ex-founder of Grays that, that um, set it up, actually. And the first, like, the first brand he set up is he's, ba- he's basically trying to disrupt the baked goods business, saying that you know, part of why childhood obesity happens is no one's been really innovating in the space. So let's um, start with the donut business. And he's created a donut that's 50% less sugar. Oh, um, and yeah, it's, why didn't you bring some? I know. <laughs> Disappointing. There's hungry faces, and it's really good. It tastes the same as as Krispy Kreme, and and you know he wants to take over, um, basically Krispy Kreme, but with the same price point. Brilliant. So mass market appeal. Awesome. Ah, I'm I, I'm sure there'll be people rushing out to buy some. Um, purpose and profit aren't always things that I, I think skeptics will say they they don't go together. Nikki over here has built a multi-million pound business with purpose running through its core that's impacting millions of people. So it definitely can. Um, so Molly, can you share your thoughts on, on yeah, how, how purpose and profit can combine and what impact can we have through that? Like just from your experience, I guess, whether it's Curl First Girls or just other things you've yeah. seen in the industry. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because I think um, that there's an interesting tension there, I think, between purpose and responsibility, right? And I think... I personally think every single business needs to be a responsible business, right? Agreed. Whatever you do, wherever you do it, I think the old adage that you kind of have a business and that's separate to society just isn't the case, right? We all have uh, responsibilities to the, to the communities that we operate in. I remember going to a talk actually a few years ago. It was um, with ThoughtWorks, a software development company, and their, their founder, Roy Singham, talked really eloquently about this idea of him running a tech company or being founder of a tech company and how that led to tension and the tension between doing good and doing harm. And I think that's kind of the human condition, right? We are all here, hopefully doing good, but also there is a cost, right? There is a cost for us existing on this planet. Um, So I think, you know, that point around sort of all businesses, profit or none, I do think that we need to have, you know, an insight into what that participation in the world looks like and how do we limit the damage of what we do. Um, As far as kind of, I guess, organizations, so companies which actually have some sort of uh, purpose, which is beyond just sort of mitigation of whatever the damage that they do. Um, I absolutely don't think that that and profit is against each other. You know, I think for me, talking about that early point, which is how do you effectively convert money into some sort of good outcome? um, And how do you see the money as being a mechanism for getting good outcomes? Um, so, you know, absolutely there is a role to be played for the charitable sectors where you might just be taking grant funding. But for me, you know, as someone who's now a sort of a serial sort of social uh, entrepreneur, um, you know, I, I don't see them as at, at odds with each other. Mm. I, I think the two work very well organically. And for me, you know, having money is just a mechanism for me to have more impact in the work that I do. Um, and thinking about the relationship of that as a business um, is, I guess, where you got to find that sweet spot because I think that's one thing with an impact driven business which you do need to think about which is is whatever you're doing for impact what is going to make you money or is there some sort of disaggregation between the two where you can effectively be using the money doing some sort of commercial enterprise and then doing something completely separate which isn't dependent on uh, you know receiving funding directly to actually have some sort of social purpose behind that so it does require you to I think think more creatively around your business structure um, and there's lots of flexibility there as well. So it's finding the thing that works for you best. Mm, totally agree. And no, I thank you for that. And um, Nikki, you talked about um, when we spoke the other day about how there have been times where the body coach has turned down lucrative opportunities because it didn't align with your, your purpose at the end of the day. 
Um, so do you mind just sharing a bit about that and kind of the implications of that um, on the business, good and bad? Yeah, I will, I will share that. But something else I think um, sprang to mind about that, and I will share that story quickly. But, um, you know, P with Joe is a good example where that was completely unexpected. And, you know, a lot of people thought it came out of nowhere. As I was saying to you earlier, you know, we've been working with schools for about four years and we've done lots of tours. And, you know, that question, how can we help more people? We, we at some point, you know, started to put, the, put that, the lens of kids on that. How can we help more kids get moving? Because, you know, we know that PE was becoming less of a thing in schools and all the rest of it. I'm sure we, we know some of the challenges there. Um, so then when we were meant to be going on this tour and um, it got cancelled because of the lockdown. And then Joe called me and said, oh, I'm... We're going to just, we'll just go live on YouTube. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, good idea. We'd already done live streams before um, with schools, so it wasn't a new thing. And we just thought, yeah, this will, you know, we'll probably do this for a week or two. I think everyone thought the pandemic was going to last a week or two at the time. Um, so Joe was in his house in Richmond, and I was at home in Surbiton with, with my headphones in. So I was in his ear kind of remotely because for two reasons. One was to, you know, give, um, give him a shout it, we knew from the schools that they loved when we said, oh, we got St. Joseph's School and Epsom are taking part. So we, and the other reason being that Joe was in his room on, in, on his own. And if, if the connection had gone, he would have never have known. <laughs> so it was more like a color of the techie, I guess. But um, so I had these like, thousands of like, schools, oh, and people, sorry, not schools, families saying, oh, we're taking part. Um, and on that first day, like we thought, you know, 10,000 people might tune in. Um, and there were 900,000 people tuned in on the first wow. day. And then. The second day, just getting big, getting bigger and bigger. And we've had a YouTube channel for years. We've always done, a, and it's always been free. And even now, it's a channel that we are committed to giving a free free workouts. Many times, people have said, "Oh, you know, you've got a fitness app that you're charging people for. Like, you need to stop doing free content on YouTube." And we've always said, "Like, no, we're always going to do YouTube because not everyone can afford the app." And that was our, and we, and so that's our kind of commitment to that. But after about two weeks of PE with Joe. I got my, um, so YouTube um, ad revenue was never really a thing for us. It was small. It was, you know, it wasn't something we really kind of um, focused too much on because it wasn't a core of our business. But, and it, you know, I can tell you, it was about, you know, £2,000 a month used to come in through um, AdSense pre-rolls on the YouTube. So I got this email from Google saying, oh, your Google AdSense is, is ready. And I looked and there, it was like £200,000. Wow. And I rang Joe and I was, well, it was like 180 grand. So I rang Joe, I was like, fuck, I was like, <laughs> the YouTube and we hadn't even thought that all the views had obviously and so that was again it was like this accidental thing and you know we went on to donate all of that money to, to the NHS and we actually Amazing. raised £580,000 um, incredible in the end but the story you're referring to and again so my point being it was unintended it was like oh accidental and that, that feeling of like oh my god how did this happen has happened you know quite a lot given the way we've, we've done things um, but yeah on the other side you know we've said no to a lot of things um the thing you're referring to, this is, you know, publicly, and this is an example of, you know, Joe has a big platform, so lots of brands want to do stuff. And we don't do much, many partnerships because we've always sort of felt they would dilute, you know, um, our long, long-term long vision, I guess. Um, but, you know, one, there was a, the biggest one was, um, or one, of, one of the big ones, a supermarket, one of the, the biggest supermarket chain in the UK, um, wanted to do a partnership with Joe. It was a huge amount of money. It was, you know, two million pounds just to sign the deal and it probably would have been worth you know five or six million pounds a year in terms of you know the, but it was it was Mike essentially it was microwave dinners it was ready meals prepared you know and we stopped to realize where it was going and I said Joe like this goes against everything that we're trying to do on the on the food side which was encouraging people to cook from scratch using whole foods and fresh ingredients so you know they're hard decisions to make um but actually it wasn't a hard decision to make yeah it was a really easy decision in the end. And we went away and we said, okay, that wasn't right. But is there a partnership for us in the food space that feels more in line? And we, we did some research. We, we found Gusto. Um, we, I sent Timo, the CEO, a message on LinkedIn and said, hey, work with Joe Wicks. We've got an idea. We'd love to talk to you. And we've been now um, working with them for four and a half years. Incredible. And, you know, they are very much in line with our ideas of food, which is, Let's get people in the kitchen cooking. And, and for many people, if you're cooking from scratch, you're halfway there. If it means you're not getting takeaways or eating processed foods. So it's not the answer, but it's definitely in line with yeah. our, 
So yeah, there, there have been that. a lot of those in the past. That's great. And I think sometimes to, to test your purpose is like, it's a good test of your conviction, isn't it? About how strong your conviction is when money is thrown into the pot. Um, and ironically, you, you went, you know, by turning that down, you ended up with an even better you know, off fit. It might not have been as lucrative, but much yeah. more aligned to, to the business. And, and just, just on that, I think that I'm, I, I'm more proud sometimes of the things we've said no to. And the very kind of behind the scenes and you never see, then I'm obviously proud of the things we've done as well. But actually, there's a lot that a lot of things we've said no to, I think, have, have helped us build the brand, you know, that we have built. It's not the things you do. It's sometimes the things you don't do. Yeah, totally. And it's authentic. And I think everyone in here, you know, can see that, you know, from the outside in. Um, I've got to talk about talent, uh, given what we do as a day job at JBM. Um the first thing, and this is, I am not lying here, the first thing almost every candidate says to us when they call us up, whether it's a CEO, a COO, or, you know, a graduate, is I want to work for a purpose-driven company. Like, that is genuinely, it just is, is on rinse and repeat, and I love it. It's, it's something that's really changed over the last few years. Um, Emma, I'd, lo- I'd love to come to you about your perspective of this from an investor. Yeah. Um, with Ascension's portfolio, have you seen like that top talent is continually being attracted to more purpose-driven startups, from your opinion? And what impact has that had on the startups in your portfolio? Yeah, I, it definitely has. So, I mean, if you think about what a startup needs at the very beginning of its journey, it mainly needs like tech talent. I mean, it needs software engineers, it needs product people. Um, and, you know, I mean, at, at least since I've been at Ascension, getting good tech talent has been very difficult, whether you're purpose driven or not. I mean, it's 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 a diffi- it's a scarce resource. Um, but what I've seen and I've got, you know, I can I can think of at least three or four examples in the portfolio. They have managed to actually get some really good software engineers, quite senior for, for you know, not necessarily a competitive salary um you know obviously equity but they they've managed to attract them because of the mission of of, of the business Amazing. and because it, because they were passionate about getting in early to support the mission of the business and it would normally be hires that you might be able to make you know after the first few rounds of funding but they they, they got them quite early it's, it's it's great to hear that and i think we're seeing that consistently i think people are willing to take a salary hit if they really believe in the product or the solution or the the impact they're going to have on the world. And yeah. um, Amali, Subak, uh, which we are big fans of, um, finds, funds, scales founders who are saving the planet. You know, it, you know it, it's, uh, it's an amazing mission as we talked about. Um, and we know that like, when, when we say purpose-driven, often, understandably, given the crisis we're in, it's about tackling the climate crisis. Um, there's a real, you know, uh, I've spoken to multiple people in the last 24 hours about this exact point. Um, what advice do you have for anyone that might be listening to this um, who might be in a more traditional corporate environment who's hearing this and just kind of just the, the fire within them is going, I've got to work in a purpose driven company. I want to make a difference in the world. Like what advice do you have for them? And what are the real benefits from, and it might involve a salary hit, but what, why is it worth it taking that risk? I mean, first tip is just join, right? Yeah, I just mean, honestly, um, and I, I say this as someone who's kind of flipped from one side to the other. I've worked on the mission side. My job prior to joining, so back I was managing director of startups at Microsoft. So I've seen the full gamut. Um, but it, it kind of comes down to, look, what, what is going to get you up in the morning and make you feel when you go to sleep at night that you've done a day's work that you can be proud of, right? What is the, the legacy that you want to leave in the world? And how do you want to feel... Um, that you have a part in that, right? Um, the other thing as far as sort of, and I guess this is where the, the purpose-driven companies are a little different to charities and obviously, you know, are, are in that middle space because you get a little bit of the best of both, right? You don't necessarily, and, you know, there are some charities obviously who I'm sure have great salaries. Um, you're definitely, even if you're working for a, you know, a, a purpose-driven company, you're not going to necessarily get the same salaries as you would get, let's say, working at Microsoft, Right. But do you need that salary? So, you know, we have people within, you know, our company, myself included, who have taken those salary hits. I don't need to be earning the amount of money I was getting paid working big tech. I can still live a comfortable life and kind of, you know, have a roof over my head, you know, feed, you know, think about buying a house, all of these types of things without that. But what I do get in addition 
is just that sense of my work matters. It means something. It makes a difference. And when I think about if I'm going to be spending eight hours a day for 50 years going into work, do I want that time to have meant something at the end of it, right? And I'm, people are different. Everyone needs different things. But I think for a lot of people, it's just that, look, if we're going to spend so much time doing something, at least do something where you feel that you, you matter, that you make a difference there. So um, true. And there are lots of opportunities. And that's one thing I would say is that and even if it's not joining a purpose-driven company, even if you're working within a, a company which maybe isn't purpose-driven or might even be a sort of polluting industry, do your bit. Do your right? bit, 100%, 100%. And people often ask me about this, and I don't think anybody rolled out of bed one day as a four or five-year-old and said, I want to be a recruiter. And I didn't do that. Um, like most recruitment people, I fell into it. But I always say to anyone that joins JBM, it's not about the commission. It's not about just smashing the phones and sending CVs. It's about impact. It's about, can you change someone's life by getting them a job that you know, could change their whole existence, that could have an impact on the world? Can you help build purpose-driven companies that are changing the world. And I think that's where, like, I think if you have that purpose within you, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You know, it's, it's, it's getting out of bed in the morning wanting to make a difference. And I, I think that point around the, the, the way that you can have cascade impact, I think is really satisfying and gratifying. And, and even for me, when I was at Code First Girls, you know, you plant a little seed over here and then you kind of see what it goes on to do. Um, so, so that's true. something which I think, you know, for a lot of people that gives them a lot back. And that ripple effect, which you see from Subac, you see from Ascension, from all the portfolio companies that, that Nikki and Joe are seeing from all the people doing the workouts and buying the books and all these sorts of things, like you're having the impact. And I must say thank you to everyone listening to the podcast, because this is our way of sharing inspiring messages and sharing important purposes and talking about things that really matter to a much bigger audience than we can in our day to day lives. Um, Nikki, we talked a bit about kind of the growth journey you've been on, you know, your you're now 40 employees. I'm sure that will continue to grow. Um, and that's a big shift for you. you. You know, you started for the first few years a much, much smaller team. Um, and we all know, everyone in this room, how important culture fit is, how, how important hiring the right talent is, particularly in those early phases. And it gets harder. It gets harder as you scale. It gets harder to kind of maintain the culture you've created. So I guess keen to hear just a little bit about how you're, I mean, there's going to be people here, I'm sure, that might apply to the body coach at some point in the future. So tell us a bit about how you assess candidates and how do you ensure that you're getting the right fit culturally and, and critically a mission alignment to that really important purpose? Yeah, you've asked this at an interesting time because like, we're like in it, like fully in it. And it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Like I'm, str I'm finding the people side of things really challenging um i don't i don't know what's harder actually managing a new team of 40 people and a bit building a leadership i've never i didn't even I, I, six months ago i didn't even know what a leadership team was um so i don't know what's harder that or managing you know my little brother essentially for <laughs> seven seven years which is he, uh, yeah i don't know they're both challenging in different ways but um it's definitely something we're in right now the culture piece is is, is my the thing that keeps me up most at night um, you know, for seven, seven years, certainly that I've been there, it's been a very small, you know, um, it's been a very small team. It's been me, Joe, and we had some support, customer support te um, team. Um, there were people in the business. It, it was a kind of gone through some phases, but for the, for the, for the most part, it's been very, very lean. Um, and now we're kind of on this growth journey. So what are we doing? Um, God, it's hard. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to you know we are trying to find people you touched on it earlier we're seeing a lot of people um, certainly you know most of the bulk of the people hiring at the moment are engineers and product people um, and yeah they're, they're, we're hearing the same thing you talked about which is people leaving really great companies that want to come and work on something that's meaningful and you know I've heard that so many times um, but yeah we're just trying to we are trying to find good people and it's you know going from that sort of family literally a family business to not, but I'm, I think I'm trying to hold on to that maybe a bit too much. It's so um, hard. It's your baby, right, at the end of the day. And I, I know this from doing it in my kitchen for two and a half years before we've grown the team. And, um, you know, you have, to, you have to learn to let go. <laughs> but also, you know, you want people that buy into, you know, what you're building. And it's, it's a hard thing to assess for. Um, but you're clearly doing a good job, you know, clearly. And I know it's, um, it's going to be kind of, you'll continue to attract the right sorts of people, I think, because of you've got such a strong purpose. And um, we talked a bit about this kind of uh, talent and, and purpose. And um, investing in purpose is also something that is uh, 
coming up a lot. We're seeing a lot more funds like investing in impact. Um, Emma, you are uh, very well placed to, to talk about this. Um, so, so why, why, why are we seeing this? Um, and uh, and you, can you tell us a bit more about the Ascension investment thesis? Uh, I guess particularly for any founders that might be wanting to pitch to you anytime soon. <laughs> um, well, I mean, Amali touched on it, which is actually it's it's quite important to be thesis driven. So you know, we're not just a generalist impact fund. We're we're trying to drive down social inequalities, which means that um, as a fund, we will we will tend to attract. Yeah, you know, the right the right type of founders because we're we're well we've become purposefully quite known for that. Um, that means that you you know we we want to build the right partnerships um, around the fund with um, say social housing with universities with corporates because they tend to be like the routes to market for for the portfolio that we invest in. They I mean some of them actually invested in our in our first fund and they they become. You know, the, they, they can become champion for, for the portfolio and they in turn are a great sell for us to get the best founders because we say, come and, you know, be, be part of our portfolio and we'll do this for you. And then as you, as you build, you know, your, your portfolio, some of the existing startups that start to scale, they get known by other founders and you, you kind of start building something that makes sense because you're all focused on this one thing, which is, for us, driving down social inequalities. So we've got in our thesis, we think about the human as a kind of the human PNL, which is, um, you know, on the one hand, we want to Im- improve your income uh, by investing in stuff for, in in social mobility, like ed tech, um, you know, income generation, in, investing in gig economy, sort of infrastructure, anything that will improve your earning potential. And then on the one, on the other hand, which is really relevant to the current kind of cost of living crisis. We invest in stuff which reduces your costs. So how can we help people live a, live a fairer, a fairer life? Um, and there's this thing um, for low-income households that's called the, the poverty premium, where low-income households actually pay more for stuff than than um, higher higher-income families because they're low-income. So you know, for example, credit access to credit. You always have more expensive credit. Um, if you can't afford direct debit, you pay more for your energy tariff. So so on and so forth. So we, we, we invest in tech solutions that will kind of solve for that. And then health, you know, health, health inequalities is something we've dif- discovered in, in, in the past couple of years. Actually, you know, there's a lot of sustainable vegan stuff that is going on at the moment, which is only sold in Whole Foods and will always be at a, you know, unattainable price point. How can you invest in things that will um, help you know, the mass market basically be healthier on the food front, on, on the mental health front, on, on, you know, other, other kind of aspects where, for example, the NHS can't, you know, can't necessarily um, look after people that well, like w- what platforms exist that can help certain conditions. So these are the kind of three p- pillars that we, uh, that we invest It's really in. interesting. Um, I guess on the other side of the the coin, and Marley, you've been uh, you, you've done lots of fundraising as a as a as an entrepreneur. Um, can you tell us a bit about your experience of that? I guess we know it's hard, particularly as a woman CEO, uh, when it comes to fundraising. All the stats are terrible and dreadful, um, and 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 those from underrepresented backgrounds, you know, even more so. Um, how's your experience been? And if, if there's anyone listening to this that you know, has an incredible idea, wants to have an impact in the world, and is going through that process right now, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, and I think the interesting thing. So, so Mac, we're actually fundraising at the moment. We launched oh. our fundraise uh, just over the summer. The yeah, if any any billionaires in the audience <laughs> come find me. Um, but uh, it, it's been quite interesting to kind of see, I guess, to take a look at the sort of the more philanthropic and sort of grant funding side against what I used to do at Microsoft, which was sort of B two B software, effectively businesses. Um, and one of the challenges I think is, and it, this is common on both sides, which was a bit surprising, is the benefit and the curse that comes from networks, right? And if you're talking about, you know, large philanthropic organizations or VC funds, you're often, I think people forget that we're talking about small organizations often, right? You don't have gigantic teams of people who are doing due diligence. So I think, you know, depending on the fund, this certainly isn't always the case, but um, from the philanthropic side, the number of them where you will go on to these large sort of um, uh, funds and they basically say, look, don't call us, we'll call you. Right? Or we only go through certain partners. 
Um, and this drives me nuts because it's kind of like, look, are you actually trying to solve a problem? If you're a climate fund, do you want to solve climate change or do you only want to solve climate change for people who are connected to you? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I think this is the thing which, especially as a minority founder or someone who is coming from a, sort of a non-traditional background or doesn't have a sort of a track record, trying to figure out how to tap into those networks mm. and to create your own networks, I think is really critical. Um, the one thing I would say, and this is from the climate space, for example, I'm actually, Subak, we had our annual conference, our first inaugural conference last, last, uh, yes, last night. Um, there are some really great networks out there who are welcoming and open and you can meet other people who are sort of trying to go into that space. It takes time. Um, and I think this is the other thing, which is not just around the fundraising sort of journey in itself and the challenges that that brings, but we're talking about current market conditions where, especially on the equity side, I'm sure you know, we've got speakers who've talked to this, things are a little bit slowing down, right? Because people are just trying to be careful, trying to figure out what's happening in the world. I haven't seen the same thing happening in grant funding as yet, but there might be a lag on that side. Um, but just keep, keep the right amount of time. You know, if you were thinking maybe a traditional raise would have taken you six months, now it might take you nine. Um, and I think, you know, we, we kind of forget that it's still relationships matter. So go and meet people, have conversations, tap your networks, don't be shy, go and have conversations with people you've seen on stages. Um, so yeah, I think just, you know, work at that um, and don't underestimate the amount of time that it might take. Amazing advice, thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki, Emma, Amali. It's been a genuine pleasure um, talking about a topic that I really care about. I know everyone in the room does too. It's, it's um, something that I think will continue to come up, I hope, in more startup conferences um, where we talk more about the purpose and the impact um, I've loved it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all for joining us too and everyone listening. Um, I have to do that plug thing where I say, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. Um, <laughs> but also just in general, like we'd love your feedback. We hope to do many more of these. Um, so anything, anyone you'd like to hear from, any other topics you want us to cover, then please do let us know. Um, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I really hope that you found it useful and inspiring. If we have left any questions unanswered, or if you have any feedback or guest recommendations for future series, then please make sure you get in touch on info at jbmc.co.uk. I often get asked by listeners how you can help us spread the word about 40 Minute Mentor. There are two simple ways you can help. Firstly, share this episode on your preferred social media platform, and LinkedIn is probably where I'm most likely to see it. And you can also leave us a review on either Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Every share on social media and review left on the podcast platforms really helps us to get 40 Minute Mentor in front of new audiences and share the power of mentorship even further. Thank you so much for your ongoing support and I look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday for even more pocket-sized mentorship. Mm -hmm.